space on that phone itself. So whenever you put anything into that phone, any app that is installed on that phone potentially has access to that data. Now, if the device itself is encrypting that data, then there's a moment that before that device has encrypted that data where it's sitting there in clear text. You swipe the card, it goes through a headphone jack, and it's on that phone. And this means that anything that you have on your phone that uh, is potentially malicious can access that data itself. So the counter question is, okay, so let's say I have a card swipe device that's encrypted. So if I'm encrypting the swipe before it gets to the phone, why is this out of scope? Well, ultimately it could be. And if the solution is evaluated, which means that somebody has, uh, like me, or an equivalent, uh, has pounded on this device and rated it as uh, secure enough that it can't be tampered with, then you can use that device as a potential P2PE solution, but you can't just take somebody's word for it. I mean, you could have you know, Jim's pretty good secure reading and encryption device, you plug it in your phone, we don't know what it does, we don't know how it's decrypted. So ultimately, uh, to make a really long answer short, is it really depends, but if, uh, if the solution has been validated, it can be done, if it hasn't, then don't do it. But if you, sorry, no, if you fine. want to talk after this uh, discussion, 
we can go on at length about it, and you can uh, we can talk in the hallway, or you can find me in the foyer later. But... So I'm I'm of the edict that yes, software can fix problems, but so can hardware, and it's kind of a mix in between. So Eric is with ID Tech, so I'm going to pass the potato to you and give your interjection. Yeah, I was going to add to what Adam was. I don't turn it off. So I didn't. Yeah, I was going to add to what Adam was saying that I think the best is to encrypt at the head or close, as close to the head as you can. So by the time the data gets to the POS or the tablet or whatever device you have, then it's already encrypted and whatever software you have there is basically you know, uh, out of scope. There are kind of two methods where you can do encryption uh, or you can do protection. One is what I would call passive security. You put as much protection as you can, but you know somebody you know with padding or all of those uh, uh, kind of uh, hardware protection to protect the data that is in the head or that is in the device. The other one is a little bit more sophisticated and will meet PCI S Red uh, certification that that's active security. So what you do when you do active security, you have what you have in passive, but on top of it. You have electronic that will erase any data, any key that is in a device in case somebody was to try to access the device. So the most protection you can get is get a PCI s device, then connect it to pretty much anything, because by the time it gets that anything is protected, and then it can be an open network like the internet, or it can be a POS, and it will only be decrypted in the back end close to the HSM. Perfect. So, continuing with that train of thought, so if I'm, a re, if I'm a reseller, how can I help retailers implement a secure network? I'll start with David, because you've got some software that has to talk if you're in an MPOS environment. How do we get to the next levels? And then at some point, you're handing it over into an infrastructure that we've got to have certified from Adam's team as well. So you start with the software, We've got a level there, and then we go back into a network environment. Sure. So, as we're is this on? Yes. yes already okay. Yeah, as we're getting into more of a wireless environment, you know, we have all these point of sale terminals out there. It used to be wired, that was more secure. Going to wireless, um, you're kind of making some assumptions, especially in the SMB world, that you have security on, and I think that's a bad assumption to make because even if the dealer sets up the security. You don't know if the end user is going to mess with it, not mess with it, how secure it is, how well they actually maintain that. So I'm actually a big fan of if you have your point of sale solution and you're going in a wireless network, don't take any risks of the scope and try to move towards an out of scope solution. Um, so we're really proponents of, yes, you should secure your network. Yes, you should have antivirus and, and do all the proper things and use a PADS as validated application if possible. But look at your actual payment technology. And there's really three different ways that you can attach or you can have point of sale and payment processing. One of them is not integrated, which means your payment device is completely separate from your POS, and it's not really a great customer experience because you have those, you know, you ring it up here, then you got to type in the dollar amount there on the second terminal, not so good. Um, you have the fully integrated, which is what most point of sale people are selling today, you know, where all the payments are routing, um, as you mentioned before, the data is routing right into the point of sale system, encrypted or not, sometimes yes, sometimes no, and the, the point of sale is processing the card. Um, the, really, I think the better way to do it nowadays, especially with um, all the EMB compliance and all these breaches that are happening and everything else, is to use something called semi-integrated, um, which means that the point of sale is driving the actual transaction, but all the transaction data is going directly from your payment device right up to your processor. Um, that can happen either through hardware, um, it can also be driven by software in the case of you know what DataCap doesn't know. And, what that means is that your point of sale software never gets access or visibility to the credit card data, encrypted or not, at all. So if somebody does actually breach your point of sale software, it's like breaking into the four knocks without the gold. There's nothing there of use you know, to any data thief. So I think that's really, to me, yes, you want to secure your network, but I would pay more attention to are you using technology that can actually just avoid any risk whatsoever. Um, that's something that we're actually installing now. We're really excited about it. It's, it's very, Customers actually really understand it. I mean, when we explain to them, data never goes into the POS, you know, they get it. It's a pretty simple concept and, and they embrace it. Adam? Is 
As far as a network is concerned, uh, as far as PCI is concerned, anything on that network, a network's a really chatty place. It's, uh, I mean, no one listens to their Ethernet cable, right? But if you were to, uh, to listen to that traffic, every device is constantly talking. And when person A is talking to person B, person C can often pick that up. So uh, network segmentation is something that we preach constantly in PCI DSS. And your end user, your merchant, isn't going to know what that means. They're not going to know how to configure their device. So we employ uh, employer resellers, anybody who's going to be installing these devices, to look at how those devices are connected and to, if possible, segment them so that you do have a, a point of sale machine talking to a back of house, but not to their, you know, the computer they use to surf the internet. Or in the case of having something that only processes credit card data, then you have that on its own segment, so it can communicate with processors, but everything else, uh, if you have uh, uh, pretty much any other device you would connect to the internet with, would be on its own segment. And that way, there's no overlap over those two networks. Justin, anything to contribute? Um, just I would say, if you're going to be a, if you're offering a point of sale solution, um, you want to try and get to an out of scope solution as best you can. You want to pull that data off of your system. Um, let the people that are going to be going through the PADSS validations, the EMB certifications, handle that on your behalf, and you just work <coughs> on expanding your point of sale offering and competing in that marketplace. Super. The other question that has come up repeatedly is, okay, so I'm used to selling a big box, typically from one of the bigger OEMs that I'm putting a bunch of data on, and I sell it as an integrated point of sale system. How do I transition my customers for traditional big box POS into tablet POS. And it's not necessarily trivial as we make that migration. Tom, any thoughts to that? The transition, there are many that believe that the, uh, the, the transition is difficult. Um, it really depends on the same. If you look at SMB uh, market, they're more adaptive to that type of technology, and it really depends upon what the value proposition is for them. I, I, I live in a, uh, a resort town, Park City, Utah, and the city council uh, promotes independent store owners. So if you look at Park City, it's, it's a lot of independent store owners versus large chains, and it's a, it's a great learning lab for the transformation of point of sale. And one of the one of the key differentiators in who adopts tablet and who stays traditional has everything to do with the total cost of ownership and the value proposition that's provided. We have had uh, merchants that have that have gone, did the 60-day trial on tablet POS. Uh, we had one go back because it was an old mom and pop coffee shop run by folks who have been running it for decades. And when they transfer that business over to their grandchildren, that's when you're going to see that transformation because they're already used to that technology. The overwhelming majority of folks that have looked at the value proposition of, of automating their enterprise have gone to tablet and stayed. Uh, we have had Restaurants that have had uh, ownership changes that have been the pillars in in the Park City community uh, moved to tablet and moved to pay at the table, uh, and, and wondering why they haven't done that uh, years ago. Uh, mobile POS provided them the opportunity and the value proposition to automate their business, uh, and that's the key it, for retailers. Retail, for big box retailers, what we have found uh, at Epson is that they're looking at how to make that work. They're, they're, many of them are using it as an addition to their uh, traditional POS, like uh, uh, pop-up POS if you know, uh, there's a, a, a TV uh, program or sale running over uh, in, in audiovisual that they can bring a pop-up stand that is uh, uh, tablet, fully wired, uh, but mobile based upon a cart. 
Uh, so they're looking at, at how they can use mobile to, to augment uh, what they currently have. But SMBs, they're the ones moving toward it because the value proposition and the total cost of ownership is right in that sweet spot. Thanks. Paul, I know you've been involved in some, you know, both large and small conversations on this migration. What, did, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I have two thoughts. Um, we about, uh, uh, I've talked to customers at all levels of the, of the uh, size and scope and scale in retail. Probably the biggest customer that I've talked to in this was about four years ago, and, and they said something that still resonates with me today, and it's kind of informed a lot of the directions that we've taken, and it's not really a, a, a secret or anything. But what he said to me in a, in a conversation about a cash for application was, you know, what I really care about with respect to the hardware at the front end is really what the consumer brings into the store with them. And what the consumer brings into the store with them is their credit card and cash. And so that informed their decision-making processes for their hardware selection and, and, and everything in every direction that they took. Um, and that helped steer a lot of our thought processes with our product directions and, and, and it's led us to uh, making all kinds of new products that, that, uh, that make it possible to um, interact. And, and we make a distinction at the cash store plant between thin and mobile. Um, uh, thin client is really kind of a, a, a bolted down tablet to us. Mobile is really mobile. You're moving around transacting where the consumer is. And we make that distinction because that affects the hardware platforms, it affects the, the decisions that they make with the types of equipment that they put in place. And, and sometimes just replacing a, a large box cash register with a tablet, in our case, doesn't really affect us, but it might affect uh, Epson or it might affect Star or it might affect some other guys that, are, that have other equipment out there. Uh, uh, the other big thing that's, that's taking place is tablets have enabled retailers to set up, um, uh, the fancy word was, was alternate distribution points. And um, that was a guy who wanted to take his, his tablet in a cash drawer and go out in the parking lot and sell some stuff for three hours. Well, how do you do that? Um, some tablets, you can plug in stuff. Well, what do you plug in? Well, there's nothing really today. But we, we're working on that uh, as we speak. Yeah, it's been transformational, honestly. The hardware platforms, the, the connectivity options, um, and enabling um, temporary in new ways, temporary transactional points in new ways that, that uh, didn't exist before. So, Thanks, Paul. And I know, Justin, you guys have been working on a solution to you know, take both the credit issues out of scope, but still give you the ability to plug all this stuff in and, and make sure that it works and that we're, we're not interfering with each other. Sure, I mean, a challenge that's out of base, especially in browser-based point of sales see today, is really driving local peripherals. So that's a, that's something that someone can take off the table. That's a huge value add. Um, I think that there's an assumption, though, that mobility is either kind of an all-or-nothing approach, and I think that's kind of the correct assumption. I think the best way to approach mobility uh, at the point of sale is to think of uh, mobile app by mobile POS extensions. So when you walk around the floor today, you're going to see um, a ton of POS providers that have maybe 50 to 100 man years of development built into a point of sale platform. And um, by adding a Windows tablet to the mix, you get to add mobility for that, uh, to that solution um, without making a lot of changes at the point of sale, without requiring a lot of custom development. So I think that's two years ago we're looking at this. Um, but, but coupling, positioning it as a security solution in conjunction with point to point encryption provides value and you can you can sell that value to your user customers. So so rather than just selling that box, you can sell a complete solution and tie it into the software. Paul, I know we've been rip and rip and all the way into just we're gonna mix and match as we go along. Any thoughts? Uh you know in point of sale with respect to cash drawers, the, the hardware has to follow the software. So the, the point of sale software direct, drives the, the architectural decisions of, of, uh, of the hardware, of the cash drawer platform. So um, being consultative, understanding, supporting the decisions, you know, we have to be part of that. Um, and providing options based on that, that that's what we're all about. Um, uh, shipping boxes in, um, people, people <laughs> People buy cashers all the time and they don't know what they're buying and they plug them in and, and they don't work because somebody didn't tell them what they bought and, and they didn't have that partner there. So uh, those, those calls happen frequently and uh, we're here to help and, 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 and an ISV or an Avar 
who can help, can be that partner even at the cash flow level, not just the chip and the pin and, and the swipe and all that, but, but the, you know, getting to know the customer, what their expectations are, is, is critical. Maybe if I could just yeah. you know, add one thing to that. Uh, so I, I think if you go back in time, a lot of the RSPA members, they were selling solutions. They were, uh, they were selling PC-based workstations at a time where PCs was still somewhat mysterious that, uh, that, that end user customers, retailers, didn't understand the details. And that's what they needed RSPA members to do. Uh, you know, in today's world, Retailers are more, because they have smartphones and tablets, they're more comfortable with technology. They're, they're, uh, and frankly, the products that are available today um, are more uh, plug and play. So the value of the RS, and I think there's been some consternation in the membership about how, how do I keep relevant in this age where you know tablets have displaced PCs and my end user customers are familiar with tablets. Well. Here's a great example of maintain that trusted advisor status and be the security consultant, the electronic payment consultant, in addition to providing a, a bundle of solution that includes this kind of Justin? Any, any Just to piggyback on that point, um, I mean, in an age today where a lot of new uh, point of sale entrants are selling direct through websites, whether it's browser based or tablet based point of sale, um, it's really important for bars to take on the technological consultancy role and really understand that of, their, of each specific merchant and be able to uh, you know, rapidly react with uh, mobility or an you know, EV solution or what have you, really be able to provide a solution that's going to fit that customer's needs. who doesn't necessarily have the ability to understand what technology works best for them, what's available in the marketplace, and what was important. So it's important for bars to take on that role and really know their customers, understand their needs, and act accordingly. Eric? Well, as a box provider, I put my boxes. So, <laughs> but to answer the question, I think it, uh, the world is much more complex today than it was 10 years ago. 10 years ago, it was pretty easy. I want a POS solution. I buy this. There is like five solutions available, and that's it. Today, there are a lot more solutions. So I think there is much more value, and in fact, need from an integrator, from the vault point of view, to help the merchants and guide the merchants because they are not going to figure it out themselves. It's, you know, even in, the, in the, the payment space, even when you are knowledgeable, it's difficult to figure out. When you have car brands saying, cheap and choice, you know, and you go and ask them, what do you mean? Well, we're not quite sure, pin or signature, you know, we'll see how it goes. And they are the guys that are supposed to drive, you know, where we are going, you know, and then you have merchants, their focus is not payment. Their focus is to get paid, but to manage their business, not to figure out all of those complex questions about EMV, about tokenization, about PCI, about end-to-end -end encryption, and God knows what's going to come next year. So I think there is more value today than there was in the past, just because the world is more complex. Uh, even though the perception is simpler because I buy a tablet and now I can put a POS together. But guess what? You buy a tablet, it's only the beginning of a long road. Absolutely. We've got about seven minutes left. Um, there's a whole bunch of people. Any hands, concerns, fears, doubts, insecurities? Questions? We answered everything? Yes? Maybe just from the payment processor perspective, what are you guys seeing for P2P gateways, tokenization gateways? What does it mean to the merchant and what does it mean to the bar? Adam and Justin? Well, uh, the issue with point to point today is that's a little bit fragmented. So point to point requires it to be uh, the card to be encrypted at the read head and then encrypted the processor side. And that requires that the processor and the, uh, and the uh, hardware provider are utilizing a, the same encryption methodology. And right now, because there's so many different varieties of, of encryption, whether it's voltage or variable or magenta or what have you, um, it's a very fragmented marketplace. So uh, from a data cap standpoint, you know, we're, we're trying to write to every single one of those so that we can have a point to point encrypted solution for all processors. But because of the fragmentation, it's a little bit slow going just because it's difficult to, uh, to, keep, just to keep pace. So once that consolidates a little bit in the next couple of years, it'll be a more ubiquitous kind of solution. Um, Adam? The, uh, the PCISC maintains a list of PPD validated solutions. This is where an assessor, such as myself, would another would review the entire chain, how the 
data is encrypted, how those keys are injected onto the device, how they're decrypted. And uh, implementing that device takes a lot of takes a lot of a network for a merchant of scope and then the reseller would need to just would need to observe um, how that device is implemented into a merchant environment. Tokenization, and we haven't really talked a lot about that uh, here, um, is an exchange of data so that a recurring transaction can be made uh, without actually having sensitive data stored. Um, if I want to have a recurring payment with a customer, I can send this card data to a processor. They give me back a token, and then I hold on to that token. Now, if that token is stolen, you can't, I mean, assuming it's a low value token, it's a low discussion. Uh, not everyone can use this token. And if someone steals my car data, or steals my computer even, that token is useless to them. Whereas for me, I'm able to do that along with a recurring payment or you know, uh, establishing some kind of uh, periodic sale with this client, I can do so without actually storing the car. So tokenization is fantastic. And uh, as a QSA, the person who's generating that token, they would need to be assessed for how they're generating that token. David? Yeah, I think the interesting thing you'll see from a lot of resellers is that you know, a lot of resellers in the past were maybe a little more open with the credit card processor choice. And I think they're going to try to start to choose partners and processors and risk from the processor perspective um, and try to enforce with their clients a little bit more. Um, you know, if you look at the way that like Square has gone to market, for example, they just say, you got to use this processor and people just go with it with a solution. I think dealers have an opportunity to do that. Um, a lot of dealers are actually making revenue from their processor partners, which is a big part of their dealership now. And I think what it gives them is consistency. I mean, the EMV is kind of, uh, it's just become even more complex somewhat to buy a pinhead and put it in the right way with the kernels and the injections and everything else. And I don't think dealers are just want to walk into a customer and say, who do you want to use? Oh, no, I've got to figure out where to get the pinhead from. They're going to want to try to introduce as much consistency as they can into their channel so they can try to roll out the same pinhead, you know, maybe a couple of different variations, but get it from the same source with the same injection key encrypted all the right way. And then when there's security upgrades or upgrades that you can pin, or like for example, SSL and TLS, which are transmission technologies that were just basically um, the PCI cancels that are no longer really that good, you know, that when all these security things come out, if their client base is on a more consistent level with what processes they're using, then they're gonna have a much easier time maintaining their client base. If a dealer is dealing with, you know, 30 customers and 15 different processors, it's kind of a little bit of an organizational nightmare for a bar. And um, I think they're just going to try to move away from that, not even just for the revenue from the processor sharing, which is beneficial to them, but so they can just more efficiently advise their clients by being, you know, mastering a few options versus trying to figure out all of them. Can I, can I just, uh, you know, yep. throw in a thought, and this is really more of a personal for my being a former engineer. Um, the good news is that there are a lot of point point encryption solutions now. Three years ago, they were rarity. Now, there are there are quite a few, and it could be directly with a, with a processor for a large merchant, or it could be through through an ISA. So that's the good news. And there is a lot of clutter. There's a lot of uh, you know uh, talk about what's the right uh, cryptography to use, um, et cetera, et cetera. Encrypting data adds a lot of value. And consider if if the large retailers that got whacked last Christmas had only been encrypting their data, uh, the a determined identity thief is going to get behind the firewall, right? We, we've seen that both with large corporations, we've seen it with government. Encrypting data is is that next level, that next ring of security. And, and my thought as an engineer is um, I wouldn't get too hung up in the minutia. I would get a solution running with my end user customer. And again, it's a value sell to your customer. Super. Well, Mickey's big hand is on the uh, on the 10, which says we've run out of time. Uh, if you have questions, you know, hit us now. We'll be out in the hallway. We'll, uh, we've got booths on the show floor. Just a reminder to download the app and take a survey, please. And then thank you again to the panel. Great conversation, great discussion. Thank you.